um, privacy, security, and human rights. And this is directed at TVD. And I want to call on stage the amazing Ojoma Ochai. A round of applause for her. Hi, Mike. Hey, Ojoma. I feel like we've been here before. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's been exactly a year. I know. For those who were here last year, Mike and I had um, uh, chats like this. And I was tempted to do no prep for this session and just ask you, of everything you said last year, what things have you changed your mind about? So oh, maybe we good, should that's start. A good, that's a good question. What have I changed my mind about in a year? Um, Is that a hard you question? You stumped me. Um, <laughs> okay, okay, I'll, I'll rephrase the well, question. Well, maybe I'll come back to that. Let I'll, me, let me put a pin the in question that one. As well. yeah. um, so last year, we, did, we talked about digital identity, decentralization, and all that TBD is building. Yeah. And so I guess my question is, what has changed in the 12 months since we had that conversation? In what way has the landscape changed? In what way has TBD changed, if it has? Well, I mean, I think the, I, I think, you know, like certainly the macroeconomic environment has shifted. You know, uh, I think we've gone through a pretty difficult period in this space. We've seen a lot of companies that were here last year are not here this year. Yeah. They've sort of gone away. Uh, the economy has not been kind to the startup ecosystem. So there, there certainly has been um, challenges, yet we're still here. Yeah. We're still here. Um, and we're continuing to, to work on this great technology, Bitcoin, and the potential that it has for, I think, creating real foundational change and driving financial access um, here and, and throughout the world. I think, uh, you know, what, I, I think what has changed is the stakes have gotten a lot higher mm. um, in the last year. I, I think that the, the dangers in the world are um, accumulating. I think we've seen the, the rise of generative AI as a major trend in technology. Mm. I think that presents real. I think that presents real challenges for privacy, uh, for democracy, for um, you know fundamental human rights. I, I, I see. I see AI as a potential threat to all three of those things. I think Bitcoin and, and technologies like decentralized identity are, are potentially important tools for resisting some of the worst excesses that we might see from the rise of, of artificial intelligence um, uh, weaponized against um, human beings on this planet, um, it's something I worry deeply about. And it's something I, I think, you know, this uh, class of technologies has a real potential to, to, to push back against, uh, against the worst harms. Not, not that I think that's a silver bullet. Um, I don't think anything is a silver mm -hmm. bullet. I think these are all tools and, and instruments that we can use to um, bend the course of history um, towards something more positive, but I, I, I think I think the, to start where I to, to end where I started with this 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 rant, um, the stakes have risen mm. um, substantially, and I think it's more important than ever that um, sort of you know not not just freedom money but freedom tech more generally mm. um, is is being emphasized because we could end up in a technological dystopia. Like that could be our future, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> with, with AI. I mean, we, we, and, I, and I think you have to kind of take that, that possibility really seriously. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's changed. I, I become more worried about those things. Mm. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that actually. It does feel much more tense and like we're on the cusp of something happening. And in that context, to today's topic where we're talking about privacy, security, and human rights, what would you say is TBD's philosophy around how you navigate and build for these things? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 have a, I haven't really said this that much publicly, but um, I, 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 I've said this sort of internally. I think, I think human rights are good for business. Mm. I don't, I, you know, I think, you know the we, the the most prosper like the most prosperity the most innovation like I think freedom, democracy, 
freedom of speech, um, freedom of association, um, all of these things are really important components to um, discovery and, 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 and the enhancement of the human condition. When you take those things away, when you have to worry about what you say, who you say it to, when you say it, that slows down the rate at which ideas are shared. Yeah. And when ideas aren't shared, that slows down the progress of scientific discovery. That means like less advancement in addressing the challenges of our time, um, of which there are many. So I, I do think it, it, it's very important. I, I, I would, I would, I, I'll, I'll openly criticize um, a lot of business leaders throughout the, the Western world that have put profits ahead mm. of human rights. It's something that I will never do. Um, if, if I feel, if I felt that in my current capacity, I had to trade um, the principles of, of democracy and, and human rights for profit, I would simply resign. Mm. Um, Um, luckily, I work for Jack Dorsey, and I, and I think he takes the same attitude, so um, as many of you know, and so I, I know that I work, you know, I work with, with, with a person in Jack that I think shares my, my view of that, and, and so I think it, we're a very special company in that sense, mm -hmm. that I get to work with someone like Jack, who I think who, who also like, would follow that mantra, that he won't, I don't think Jack would ever trade. Um, like just simple profit on the back of human rights, and, and I, 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 I know I, I can't speak for him, but I, I believe that to be true, and I think that that comes through in, in, in the things that, that he says. And so I, I, I'm lucky that I don't have to worry about making mm. that choice at a company like Block. Um, but I, 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 I do see, I, I see, I look around me um, in the tech sector, in the, the Silicon Valley, and yeah, I, I, I question the choices that a lot of um, uh, you know, like, I don't want to take away the credit. These are really respectable entrepreneurs that have built really great things. But I think the consequences of, you know, who they, um, who they serve, who they choose to serve, and who they choose not to serve in order to align interests with, um, quite frankly, um, some pretty dark forces in the world. Mm. Uh, and and not, not that they're intentionally trying to do evil. I mean, the profit motive is very intoxicating, and I get it, and shareholders want to make a buck. Um, but I, I do think that that's short-sighted. I think in the end, I think those shareholders will get bitten in the ass when they realize that they have, that they have empowered forces that, that, that will ultimately come to get them as well. Um, so I do think that we're moving into a world where I think, you know, we, <laughs> You know, people talk about things like ethical capitalism and ethical mm -hmm. business practices. Well, what is more ethical as a business than actually caring about like the fundamental substrate mm -hmm. of society that you built your business on? Mm -hmm. To build a business in a free and democratic society, but then serve the interests of those who would undermine those principles seems to me to be um, anything but ethical. Mm. Absolutely. And, and just moving on to s sort of privacy, you've talked about human rights um, versus profits. Uh, thinking of privacy, um, we, we have had this conversation before. I'd really like to hear your thoughts about how we navigate this. Um, we talk about freedom money, we talk about freedom tech, which I think you made a great point there. Um, and then we talk about privacy and the role of the state versus the role of tools like Bitcoin. Yeah. How do you see it working in the real world, all of these paradigms? How do you see it working? Well, I mean, you, you could argue that we already do see it working. I mean, I think the internet itself was a great uh, piece of freedom tech, mm. right? That, that brought us all together. We, and, and the internet is the internet is built on decentralized open protocols. We yeah. sometimes forget about that. We kind of, it's it's like yeah. it's like air now. We don't even like see it because we live it and breathe it. Um, but we've also seen that like technologies are are often um, two sided things. Like they can be used for good and they can be used for evil. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, like uh, the internet. I, I think of the internet as freedom tech, but I also 
view it as as potentially a system of oppression. And I think, you know, when you say how do we, I mean, how do how do we see all these things working together? Well, look, I mean, like I think I think the good news and the reason for hope is that a lot of these things that we're working on, pay, new payments technology, new payments protocols, new uh, self-sovereign identity protocols. These things are actually good for business when you think about it. Because it's not just about the fact that they empower you to protect your fundamental human rights, and they can certainly be used in that sense. They can certainly be instrumentalized towards those, those goals. But it's also good because it provides the basis for robust competition, mm. for the ability to like, like break free of really of, of, of market monopolists or oligopolies in the market where small upstart companies find themselves at the whims of these large market incumbents who have essentially built a, a network effect moat around themselves that can't be disrupted. So like from a few, from like a pure sort of like market, like just capitalist perspective, mm -hmm. I actually see that like long term, in the same way that say like Linux, took over the data center mm. because everyone didn't want to have to pay for a Microsoft Windows server yeah. license and that suddenly you had this free open source software and, and everyone switched to using Linux on the server um, and, and most of the internet runs on Linux servers mm. today. That, that happened for, for market reasons. Mm. The same reason that all these open protocols like HTTP and um, the, you know, TCP IP, these open mm. protocols, like, like there could have been proprietary versions of mm. those protocols with vendor lock-in, but the open model won in the end because it enabled the largest ecosystem with the greatest amount of productivity. It, cr it created a substrate, a, substrate, a substrate upon which entrepreneurial activity could occur. I see the same thing with like open payments technologies, mm. with open identity technologies, because if you think about it, if you're a business, I don't want like a large company to be responsible for the identity of my customer. I, mm. Like we see all these things like sign in with this company, sign in with this company, sign in with this platform. I mean, you're, you're, you're intermediating your customer relationships with these large platforms. Like, like there's, there's, th th that's not what anyone really wants to do. They do it because they want, like, to get people efficiently through their onboarding funnel and convert people into customers, and so they're going to do the easiest thing. But if an easy alternative existed, like people had a standard self-sovereign identity, like, why wouldn't the market use that? So I, I think that in this case, I think long, in the medium to long term, the market incentives and the human rights incentives actually line up, like, more than most people think. But there's a lot of work to be done to make those make make sure that the first part of what I said is true, that it actually is the easy choice, um, and I think it will be, and I and I have a lot of hope in these technologies. Mm. Thank you, Mike. So I, I feel like a common factor when we're thinking of privacy, human rights, security, is the role of authority in in all of this, right? Um, and how authorities wield it. Yeah. What's your view of the relationship between authority and these topics that we're talking about? <coughs> yeah, well, I mean, look, I mean, I, I, like, like, authority is an uh, inherently bad thing. Um, you know, we have, like, uh, you know, Farida has, is, you know, set this conference up. She's the ultimate authority at this yeah. conference. <laughs> uh, um, and, and, uh, so, I mean, author authority, uh, uh, authority can be used for good and it can be used for bad. Um, I think you and I were having a conversation earlier. Um, if I was being beaten up on the street by somebody um, and a police officer who wielded authority came to save my life, I would be pretty happy about the existence of authority in that mm. case. Now, to the extent that authority can be abused, that it can be used for the suppression of human dignity, for the suppression of human rights, obviously we don't want to see authority used in those ways, and that's why it's very, very important for us to have um, well, democracy at, at its core is, is one of our checks on authority, like, like the, uh, to derive some consent from the governed, um, but also civil society, uh, civil, civil society organizations that, that, that form, that, that, that actually hold, hold authority to account and educate the, the, the public on the nature of, of, of how authority is used, and then technologies like Bitcoin 
like decentralized identity, are civil society tools that allow us to place limits on the ability of authority to exert, to exert and, and extort influence over us in a negative way. So I think, I mean, I, I, no one, uh, authority, authority is ultimately a double-edged sword. And I think, I think to a certain extent, like, yeah, like we, we, you need, we need authority. Um, uh, otherwise, like, we have absolute chaos. But we also need to check authority and make sure that it serves our interests as, as free, free and, and, and dignified human beings. Absolutely. We've now run out of time, Mike, so I would ask one last question. I know there's builders, there's Bitcoiners in all kinds of spheres in the room. What would be your sort of, I was going to say charge, but that's a heavy word. <laughs> what would be your sort of some words, some ideas for people to consider as they build and navigate in this? context that we've just been discussing? We've got to find a way to make these tools as easy as possible to use for people who are not technical. I mean, that, that sounds trite to say. But, but it's so true. But it's true. It's very true. I mean, that's what we need to do. It's, it's, it's so fundamentally important. I think we need to, to remember that technology has to serve humans, and not all humans are technologists. We need to build tools that help ordinary people, and we have to hold ourselves account. If your grandmother can't figure out how to use it, you should probably think about how you can make that so your grandmother can use it. Like, I mean, like, uh, like I mean, it's 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 really like a, a pretty simple idea, and I think sometimes we lose ourselves in how cool this technology is, and it's nice to go into a terminal and run a Python script and see a whole bunch of text scroll and be like, look what happened. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but like literally 98% well, of the population yeah. has no fucking idea what just happened. Exactly. So um, I, think we, I think we need to remember who we're building this for. 100%. I think that's a good note to end. We need to remember who we're building it for. Thank you so much, Mike. See you, you again Ojima. next year. <laughs> and thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, let's keep it